Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Guillermo Gomez, Program Director at the Urban Design Forum. If you'd like to access transcription for our event, feel free to click on the closed caption button at the bottom of our Zoom window. Thank you for tuning in today to our eighth event of our Shapeshift series. Also wishing everyone a happy Eid uh, all, to all those who are celebrating. We launched our series back in 2019, ready to shape a new plan for the city's design and development process under the next mayor. We organized discussions on the history of New York City's zoning code, uh, the community planning process, and looking back at historic race-based planning practices that created the spatial inequalities that exist today. We also brought speakers from other cities to share new and big initiatives to shape equitable neighborhoods like our friends in Minneapolis and Los Angeles. Then 2020 hit, coronavirus upended our lives, our city, and of course, the 2020 mayoral race. The forum responded. We led numerous initiatives to speak with other city leaders on their coronavirus responses, launched a community, de community design initiative in the hardest hit neighborhoods, and led a discussion series on community development ways to shape a uh, just economic recovery. But we knew that shaping the next New York will need brilliant minds, a transformational plan and powerful ideas. So throughout 2020, we got to work with nearly 50 of our forum fellows over 20 meetings and nearly 50 hours of discussions. Our fellows advise us on the best directions our city must take in order to shape inclusive, equitable and sustainable neighborhoods. In March, the forum released 21 Visions for 2021, a resource and call to action for New York City's next leadership, packed with policy proposals across seven defining issues on the built environment. The 2021 election is a once in a, once in a generation opportunity to define a new plan for our city by shaping equitable and fair growth citywide, leading in design excellence across the public realm and public buildings, ensuring ongoing community engagement through civic infrastructure, developing community planning tools to welcome good growth, instituting a right to housing that secures permanent homes for every New Yorker, safeguarding the city with a comprehensive climate strategy and establishing working neighborhoods and access to jobs in every neighborhood, in every borough. Our advisors, a multiracial and multi-generational group of professionals ranging in ages, industries, and backgrounds map the current systemic and future challenges in New York City's built environment. And we're lucky to have some of them join us on our event today. We grounded our approach for 21 Visions in racial equity, economic, dem economic democracy, and climate action, and with the pandemic informing us on how to shape a better recovery. At the core, our 21 Visions highlights the spatial injustices that have been magnified by the pandemic and offers better ways to plan and grow. In the coming weeks, uh, leading up to the June 22nd primary, we wanna center planning and design throughout this election cycle. We'll continue to host a series of discussions, inviting some of our advisors and forum fellows to point out big ideas for the next mayor. Today, we have a really exciting conversation in store kicking off New York City's design days. How can the next mayor support inclusive and accessible design in the public realm? Today's conversation is very much uh, about how the design process can inform equitable design of our streets, our parks, transit, plazas, and buildings. What would a public realm look like that serves and welcomes seniors, women and children, people with disabilities, BIPOC and immigrant and working class communities? We're so privileged to have a mix of designers uh, working across um, many sectors, each bring such rich perspectives and expertise to the table on how we must center marginalized communities in the design process. So today's lineup will look a little like this. We'll launch our presentations with Seb Cho, uh, Associate Director of Mixed Design and Inclusive Design Think Tank and Consultancy, followed by Lindsay Harkema, who will be representing WIP Collaborative, a feminist architecture collaborative that creates community-based projects in the public realm. We'll then uh, have Justin Garrett Moore, a transdisciplinary designer and urbanist, and is the program officer for the Humanities in Place program at the Mellon Foundation. We'll have our first three speakers share ideas and principles, uh, goals and visions of what inclusive and accessible design in the public realm can look like under the next mayor. Uh, and then we'll welcome Margaret Jankowski from Trahan Architects and Imbar Kashoni of DOT Streets Ambassadors program to share ideas uh, for the next mayor on how we can institute effective processes and how to manage the public realm and, and lead inclusive co-design efforts with residents. So throughout our discussion, we welcome questions in our Q&A box at the bottom of our Zoom window. Uh, if you share an inspiring question, we might be able to unmute you and ask you a question live towards uh, the later portion of our event. So I'd love to invite uh, Seb to join us on screen and, and kick off today's event. Thanks for joining us, Seb. Yeah, the mic thanks you. for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hi, everyone. Let's see if this works. 
can you give me a thumbs up or something, Guillermo, if everything looks good? Good. Cool. Right on. So thanks for the introduction and really happy to be with everyone here today. And thanks so much to Urban Design Forum for hosting today's event. My name is Seb Che, and today I'm calling in from the unceded territory of the Ute tribe, otherwise known as Colorado, but you'll usually find me on Edisto Natchez Cuso land, also known as Charleston, South Carolina, as well as in New York. A little bit about me, I'm the child of Korean immigrants. I'm gender fluid, I use they, them pronouns. I'm a popular educator, performance artist, city council agitator, digitally embodied raver, community facilitator. And I share this because for me, any project that aims to democratize the public realm requires acknowledgement of the many identities and roles that we play in our communities. And these roles exceed the roles of expertise found during working hours and must be considered when thinking about inclusive city making, which happens at many different scales and speeds. But that being said, one of the roles that I play most often is as associate director at JSA Mixed Design. We're composed of two overlapping branches, both based in New York City. JSA shown on the left here is an architecture studio specializing in institutional and arts projects. And mixed design shown here on the right is an inclusive design think tank and consultancy dedicated to creating design recommendations and prototypes to make public spaces and everyday buildings, including restrooms, university campuses, workplaces, and art museums accessible and welcoming to a broad diversity of people across age, gender, race, and culture, religion, and ability. So Mixed Design assembles cross-disciplinary project-specific teams that pull from our in-house staff, a board of advisors, and a network of consultants, some of whom are shown here, which include experts not only in design, but also diversity and inclusion and policy to consider the spatial needs of diverse users in space. And of course, our team is in a lone savior. We're one node in conversation with a rich constellation of designers and activists working on the issue of inclusive design, some shown here, and all of my panelists, of course, uh, fellow panelists would qualify. So why is this movement doing this work? It's because we've inherited a legacy of exclusion. Historically, buildings have been designed based on dimensions for measuring the so-called normal body, one that is assumed to be white, able-bodied, cisgender, and male. This ergonomic data continues to haunt the standards and regulatory codes that govern architecture today. So that's what we're inheriting. We celebrate and build upon the disability rights movement's work to create laws like the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act. However, in architecture, these accommodations tend to focus on wheelchair users manifesting as separate ADA ramps and entrances, which can potentially stigmatize those with quote unquote special needs. So our goal at Mixed Design is to generate opportunities that allow a broad spectrum of differently embodied people to mix in public space, building upon this legacy of universal design, hence our name Mixed Design. This process shown in our, this diagram shown here aims to be intersectional, considering the many overlapping identities that we inhabit, as well as the different activities we perform in this diagram showing the activities we perform in the restroom. And we do this to generate spatial strategies that can be employed to foster sharing amongst individuals, families, friends, and caregivers, while also keeping in mind that there are no one size fits all solutions. So this process needs to be repeated um, on a project by project basis. And architects can't do this alone. We advocate for the active participation of stakeholders and end users who provide valuable insights from their lived experience of the built environment, getting around the table to ensure that those who are most impacted have a seat in the decision-making process. So we aim to put these principles into practice through different initiatives. One of the ones we're best known for is STALD, which we started in 2015 in response to national controversy around transgender access to public restrooms. And over the past six years, we've published design recommendations and prototypes, like the prototype for an airport restroom shown here, and raising awareness through lectures and workshops across the country and abroad, as well as legal initiatives like amending the International Plumbing Code to make all gender multi-user restrooms legal. And as the stalled initiative has grown, our collaborators at Yale School of Public Health has helped us realize the extent to which currently traditionally accepted sex segregated male female restroom design fails to meet the needs not only of trans people, but many different restroom users shown in the matrix here, including Muslims performing voodoo or pre-prayer washings, people with colostomy bags, people that may need adult changing tables or who have pyoresis, shy bladder syndrome, the list really goes on. And we bring this research to our work with clients on built projects to adapt our recommendations to meet the specific needs of different audiences, knowing that 
each building has a different audience and that you want to accommodate those specific users and communities. Another initiative that we have is Mixed Museum, which rather than looking at restrooms, looks at art museums and how they've been traditionally designed in ways to exclude certain visitors. This drawing here demonstrates the standard hanging heights of paintings that doesn't work for wheelchair users, children, or people with dwarfism, just to name a few. And we're kind of working on this initiative by partnering with case study museums, shown here, Queens Museum, with a two-year federal grant from IMLS. We've recruited an access cohort shown in this top row of diverse Queens residents. These include wheelchair users, blind and low vision folks, seniors, um, and non-native English speakers, which is essential in thinking about the Queens Museum and that diverse locale. And we're collaborating with this access cohort to reimagine the architecture of the museum to better meet their needs. Um, and we're starting to come up with preliminary ideas shown in the design below, but we'll continue be to be doing this over the next year. Um, I also wanted to share one non-mixed design project that I work on locally in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, this is a grassroots campaign called Friends of Gadsden Creek that I'm a lead facilitator with that is opposing the largest development in Charleston's history that would accelerate a century long pattern of environmental racism and gentrification in a historic black community that's been treated as the city's uh, kind of landfill backyard shown in this aerial photograph series here. So this project differs from mixed design in that it's a bit of a larger scale. We're looking at the scale of a neighborhood as well as an explicit focus on racial justice, but it's also similar to mixed design's work in that we start from a critical analysis of the history of injustice that's codified into the built environment. And then we demand that those who are most affected, in this case, the Gadsden Green community, a formerly racially segregated public housing complex to play an active role in imagining alternative futures for self-determination. And some things that I've learned over the past few years working in inclusive design is shown here in blue. Nothing about us without us. Designers and planners should look like who we're designing for. And if that's impossible, ensure projects include a phase of meaningful engagement with the diverse audience that will use the space. Second, open access to funds. Holistic accessibility must be prioritized as an essential budget item like fire safety. This requires clients and grant makers alike to designate dedicated funding to allow building professionals to rise to the challenge and integrate this engagement into project schedules. Know the history, take advantage of the rich knowledge cultivated by the trans community, disability community, et cetera. Give these groups credit or better yet, pay them. Too often I see things get subsumed into sanitized diversity and inclusion rhetoric that doesn't acknowledge the leadership of grassroots advocates. And last, design beyond standards at all scales. Expanding access at the scale of the city must happen simultaneously with smaller acupunctural improvements. Creating holistic reports and guidelines must also be balanced with imperfect, down and dirty pilot projects that leverage jurisdiction that you have to meet, address immediately known issues. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, much, Seb. Incredible to see kind of the breadth of work from mixed design and also the work you've been leading in Charleston. I'd love to invite Lindsay to join us next up for her presentation, um, representing a WIP Collaborative. I'll pass the mic to you. Thanks, Guillermo, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm excited about the conversation and, and to, to sort of share the mic with uh, these esteemed co-presenters. Um, I'm sharing my screen now. Hopefully you see WIP graphic. So um, my name is Lindsay Harkema. I'm an architect and educator, and I'm representing WIP Collaborative, which is a feminist architecture collective of independent design professionals that focuses on research and design projects that engage community and the public realm. We combine experience in architectural design, landscape architecture, urban design, and community engagement. And we emerge from a broader community of women in practice to operate as a collaborative alternative to a conventional architecture firm. WIP offers an adaptable cooperative framework to enable our collaborative and interdisciplinary design work. Our team of seven designers includes Abby Coover, Elsa Ponce, Ryan Brooke Thomas, Bryony Roberts, myself, Lindsay Harkema, Sarah Gadaki, and Sonia Gimon. And we were previously connected through mutual invo involvement in various uh, initiatives and nonprofits that work to bring design to communities and organizations in need, such as Open Architecture Collaborative New York, Design Advocates, and 
uh, Urban Design Forum's Neighborhood Now initiative. And in the interest of today's discussion, I'm excited to share one of our projects that is currently in construction and will be an accessible streetscape installation in the Hudson Square neighborhood in Lower Manhattan uh, later this summer. This project was enabled by a partnership between Urban Design Forum, Hudson Square Properties, and the Hudson Square Bid, who selected WIP's proposal, Restorative Ground, as the winner of the Care for Hudson Square design competition last year. Restorative Ground will offer a landscape of choice to support the reemergence of community into the public realm and a space for a range of experiences, activities, and interactions to occur between residents, community members, and the broader public. The installation is intended to be a platform for individual and collective engagement, recreation, and healing. The aims of this project are reflective of WIP's broader values related to the design of a more inclusive public realm, which are facil facilitating change by engaging or excuse me, enabling a broader range of the environment, diversifying public space in form, appearance, and performance, responding to context through engagement with local communities and organizations, and crafting immersive environments to give meaningful shared experiences. This project also emerged from WIP's ongoing research about inclusive play spaces and design for neurodiversity with a focus on the needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Through a series of interviews and discussions with experts and self-advocates, WIP is learning about environmental conditions and spe specificities that can be beneficial for those populations' heightened sensitivities. During this process, we developed this working visual map of sensory experience, exploring ideas of high and low simulation, color, tactility and texture, natural and synthetic materials, active and passive play with interactive objects, and individual and collective opportunities for participatory action. Restorative ground applies some of those ideas to the design of the streetscape by incorporating subtle shifts in geometry, material, and texture to create distinct experiential zones and to support different uses. Specific elements such as the big tables, playscape peak, and lounge hammock perform as interactive furniture to encourage different kinds of activities in a non-prescriptive and open-ended way. The three zones, focused, active, and calm, were designed to enable varying degrees of stimulation and activation with specific users in mind, though not limited to any one interpretation or functionality. As shown in this diagram, we imagined what sentiments and activities might be encouraged in these zones, as well as who it might appeal to in order to achieve that range. Lastly, WIP continues to explore design opportunities for a more inclusive public realm through environmental diversity, as opposed to the more common and conventional one size fits all approach. And that's the conclusion of my presentation. So thanks again. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm excited to dive into that uh, just shortly in our, in our conversation. Exciting to see that work uh, kind of start coming into fruition. I'd love to pass the mic next uh, to Justin to join us on screen. Hey, Justin, how's it going? Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me get my screen going. Uh, so thank you uh, also to UDF and my fellow panelists and all the guests uh, joining. Um, so many of you know me, I had a, a long career in New York City government, uh, really working on exactly the issue of, of democratizing the, the public realm. Uh, now I've moved on to a different role at the Mellon Foundation, but I'm still very much rooted in and connected in uh, this work of sort of understanding how we make our places better for everyone. I wanted to start with uh, this topic to really underline this idea of democratizing the public realm and, and what does that look like and what does it mean? Uh, this is an image from uh, last May, uh, or June, uh, with the Center Street Black Lives Matter mural, and, and it's sort of a provocation of what it looks like for people to uh, have a say, to have a presence in their public space, 
and, and, and what it is and what it looks like. The image shows uh, TJ Muhammad, a, a black artist uh, who was uh, able to kind of show an expression uh, for how our streets might be remade with the statement that black lives matter. But what's important here is that this was work done with a coalition of designers, urbanists, uh, and members of the Black Lives Matter of Greater New York uh, organization, right? So this is what it looks like when people like Black Lives Matter protests uh, get to say what happens in our street. We know the, you know, chant whose streets are streets. What does that mean and what does it look like? And so we have to think about in this, this conversation about our public ground of what we're going through uh, today and to acknowledge what we have been going through for a long time. Uh, this particular mural down at Center Street, kind of our civic center, uh, lies on top of uh, the footprint of what was the uh, burial ground for African uh, people uh, way back. And so it's important to know the kind of the histories of our public realm and public spaces as well as we do this work. And so, you know, the other dimension that people are probably more familiar with was that we've all obviously been through a lot together with the pandemic. Uh, and so many of our conversations about public, uh, the public realm have acknowledged uh, the value and the importance for what our public realm and our public spaces and our commons do for all of us uh, to be able to uh, make us healthier, uh, but also to, to be that connective tissue uh, for society to be able to go through difficulty and challenge. Uh, and this is an image from Hunters Point South, uh, a project that I worked on during my, my many years in, in public service, uh, where there is thinking up front that what our public realm does, how it looks, what we center, what we prioritize might look different from what has done, been done in the past. Uh, this is an image of Center Boulevard, uh, which instead of centering the cars, we centered things like bikes and pedestrians and even bioswales uh, as being the focus for our work. And so while this neighborhood is growing significant amount of development, including things like affordable housing, new schools, uh, different types of services and, and public space, uh, kind of what we censor and what we value, where we put our budgets, where we put our agency work uh, is something that the city has done and can do going forward. And it's not always in the kind of the big complicated uh, expensive projects. Sometimes it's it's creativity and, and doing things that are simpler. People are, are by now very familiar with open streets. Uh, the idea that uh, we're able to make administrative changes that are, that are also designed and have a, a huge impact uh, like this image of 34th Avenue in Jackson Heights a uh, neighborhood that uh, is lacking a uh, uh, significant amount of public space and park space, uh, being able to, to take over the streets uh, with sort of the simple act of, of changing who has priority over that space and that we're able to do with, with even smaller actions and thinking, uh, things that are quite transformative in, in terms of our uh, public space through its, its design and occupation uh, and activity. And so while I was still at the, the Design Commission, we worked with uh, the Fine Arts Federation of New York and a number of different agencies, uh, the Van Allen Institute uh, and the Great Staff, of course, the PDC, uh, Lloyd uh, Jenna Miller, um, who were starting to have this conversation about the, the future of the city uh, and, and our streets. The conversation actually started with a different dimension of democratization of, of our public realm and public space talking about things like safety and security, uh, uh, sort of design for uh, when things fall apart uh, in a way, but uh, reimagined and rethought to think about what, what our public realm might look like when, when things are designed to grow together, uh, to be together. And so centering uh, concepts like wellness uh, and, and community and how we think about our place uh, this was a, a sort of a brainstorm from a number of different partners across city agencies, such as Department of Health, City Planning, uh, New York City Housing Authority, et cetera, to talk about what were the ways that we were going to do this work. 
Uh, so concepts about transparency and trust uh, actually came up uh, in, in those conversations uh, as ways to think about how we get to uh, more uh, democratic and equitable landscapes for our city. And so um, those who know me, I know that I love this slide. This is the organization chart for the city of New York. You know, the 300,000 people that are charged with uh, sort of understanding and navigating and operating our, our commons, our public realm of our city. And there are all these different agencies and departments and uh, people say, okay, well, we need, an, we need a new agency, we need a new department, uh, whether that's the Department of Public Realm or, or a deputy mayor that's in charge of, of making sure that all these things work. And that, that may be, in it, but we have to acknowledge that there's this existing sort of complexity and hierarchy and structure that, that is a real challenge um, uh, to navigate. And so what I would offer is that we have to think about new tools and new approaches for uh, how that might happen. Uh, and this is sort of a, a concept that rather than creating just another box, another silo, uh, or necessarily creating another kind of hierarchy, something like a mayor's office or a deputy mayor, uh, that we may need to think in another way and to think kind of laterally uh, about all the work that is already happening in the city and so many different agencies and departments and, and to think about how uh, within each of these, there may be the concept of uh, a department of care, right? Not as a separate entity or agency, but that's something that is embedded within each agency and department that is making decisions and uh, uh, kind of providing the care of our communities, whether that's the design of our streets uh, or the design of a, a public building or public resource, or whether it's thinking about how those things are maintained and cared for. Um, this concept is, is something that is, is sort of a challenge to our normal modes of operating, which are about uh, kind of control and capital, uh, uh, something like building a space or maintaining a space or policing a space. Uh, that instead might shift toward ideas like caring for a space or understanding a place uh, and, and centering that type of work in some of our thinking. Um, so with that, that's my, my last slide. Thank you, Justin. And it, really exciting to see the, the, the incredible work you led at, at the Design Commission. Um, and actually the perfect segue into our, our next presenter, Margaret, um, share a little bit more about uh, how she's imagining and, and her also her collaborators are kind of imagining and management of the public realm. I'll pass it to you, Margaret. Great. Thanks, Guillermo. And yeah, glad to be here as a part of this conversation with all these incredible um, co-presenters. So uh, I'm not going to share slides. I'm just going to um, speak in a more conversational way, hopefully. Um, but I wanted to talk about some of the ideas that uh, we developed as part of the Urban Design Forum's Forefront Fellowship um, on homelessness in New York City after Mayor de Blasio's turning the tide on homelessness. Um, so right off the bat, I do want to mention that this work was done collaboratively, not only um, a lot of the research with, with our full 20 person cohort, but more specifically with Madison Lowe and Stella Kim. And we worked closely in partnership with Nikita Price and Eric Goldfisher, uh, Picture the Homeless, as well as Josh Dean with Human NYC. Um, and it was really important for us to be um, working closely with both of those groups who have long advocated for for and worked with and been a part of the community of people experiencing homelessness um, and whose work will continue. And if you're not familiar with them, I really strongly encourage you to check them out because um, the work they're doing is really, really powerful. So um, the state, the current state of our public realm often is that it is inhospitable and sometimes dangerous for those who are really very vulnerable. Um, not just those who are without shelter, but also immigrants and those who are elderly or um, many others. So many times this inhospitability doesn't come just from the physical design of the space, though of course we all know now um, the, the concept of hostile architecture and all that that encompasses. But even when a space is really thoughtfully designed, um, 
many times everyday interactions that people in those spaces have with those who are managing them can create a really inhospitable environment. So in our work, thinking about this condition as designers, this led us to the question of really, who are the gatekeepers of our public open spaces? And the reality is that much of New York City's public realm, at least the areas that are most highly trafficked, are really increasingly privatized and policed. Um, and this has been going on developing over the past decades, beginning in the 70s with the extreme defunding of our public realm and the slashing of capital budgets and maintenance budgets, which has continued. Um, and then leading into the 90s with Mayor Giuliani's Police strategies, specifically police strategy number five, targeted people experiencing homelessness and um, you know, labeled them as, I think, dangerously mentally ill street people. And this perception persists and leads to um, really difficult situations for those who are in the public realm. So today, private organizations do play a big role in maintaining and managing New York City's public realm. These can include business improvement districts, um, conservancies, friends of groups, private landowners, um, many of which really did step into the gap created in the 70s and, and continue on through today. It's a big part of our public realm ecosystem. For example, in Midtown Manhattan, um, 68 of the 76 acres of open space fall within the boundaries of eight different business improvement districts. Um, and so that's 90% of all of the open space in that neighborhood. And in addition to the general oversight, many of the signature parks in Midtown are managed by different nonprofits or conservancies. So we have a really complex management ecosystem um, that is highly uh, privatized in many situations. And adding to this, the, the slide that Justin showed about the real complexity of how many city agencies are working in the public realm, they're charged with designing, funding, and maintaining it. Um, obviously, Department of Parks and DOT planning, small business services, those are kind of the big players, but you have Department of Homeless Services, Health and Mental Hygiene, um, the Design Commission, of course, the DEP, there's so many um, agencies and it's a very complex uh, web. So part of our, um, our thinking is that they're really, the city would benefit from someone with general oversight, a comprehensive thinking and approach to this, and a level of responsibility for the public realm, which is just not how the system is set up right now. And the result of this really complex web in the long history is that um, management is in private hands and private or commercial interests um, kind of tend to be prioritized. And this leads to viewing users of the public realm um, as customers as opposed to the public. So for those who don't fit the bill of what's deemed a desirable user of public space by those who are managing it, they're often asked to, to move away, to leave the space for doing things that everybody does, for, for sitting, for eating, for chatting. Um, and sometimes they're not only asked to move away, but they're, these acts are criminalized and they're, um, they become uh, involved with the criminal justice system and um, that cycle starts and is continued. So we're, we propose that New York City needs to reclaim its public realm, working incrementally. Of course, all of these decades of um, history and, and this whole ecosystem won't be changed overnight. Um, but we did propose an office of the public realm, something that is charged with coordinating all these different agencies and stewards, providing public oversight and ensuring that New York City's public spaces are better serving everyone. Our thinking was, imagine what New York City could do if we were thinking about our public realm as a major part of our city, like we do with buildings, like we do with streets, not only for parks, but also plazas, sidewalks, waterfronts, playgrounds, green streets, beaches, all of our public open spaces. Uh, at its core, though, the idea of an office of the public realm is not just that the city should approach its open space as a real asset, um, it's that the public realm belongs to the city, that it's a vital part of our city. And obviously this ethos permeates many of the agencies that Justin was talking about and the work that they're doing now. Um, so we really think that if we can improve our entire city if we approach our public realm with the idea that centering the needs and the dignity of our city's most vulnerable users will improve the city for everyone. 
So we, um, in addition to working on these kind of big questions of equitable access to quality open space, adapting to climate change and how all of these open spaces are working toward that goal, um, reclaiming the management of public spaces. We also outlined a few ideas that this office of the public realm or could be uh, you know, structured differently, but this office can start to immediately start improving the dignity uh, of those who are vulnerable and living in the public realm. One uh, idea is to create a bill of rights that can be handed out similar to what the ACLU does that helps people understand what their rights actually are. Um, they can work with existing organizations to connect people living in the public realm with the services they need. Many of the bids we spoke with, um, they do do this, but it is not their primary goal and it's really difficult for them to navigate this complex web. Um, so having a, a single person to go to was something that came up over and over again as a, a really easy way for them to streamline this process and, um, you know, help people who are already there. Another thing is to um, implement implicit bias training for business improvement districts and any organization that's involved in managing public space um, so that we can defend the dignity of people who are experiencing homelessness or who are otherwise marginalized. Um, I mean, like all of us, management entities and their boards and their staff operate under stereotypes about why people might live in the public realm and who those people are um, these stereotypes are often really dehumanizing and marginalizing, and we know that no policies are going to be effective without addressing them. So um, we think this is an opportunity, however it's structured, to not only think about public space differently, but to change how we structure the management of public space and who is at the table making these decisions. One thing, in order to keep that core philosophy of centering the needs of public space or the needs of the most vulnerable, we believe that formerly and home, currently homeless people need to have a voice. Uh, we need to rethink how decisions are made about public space and who those gatekeepers of that public space are and create space at the table for a broad range of voices. That's it. Thank you, Margaret. Um, terrific to continue hearing about this work. And, and also it's exciting to hear that even some of the current mayoral candidates are uh, starting to implement some of these ideas in, in, into their own platforms around the Office of the Public Realm. Um, um, let's invite, uh, lastly, um, Inbar Kishoni to join us to share a little bit about the work that she's been leading um, uh, with the Streets Ambassador Program at DOT. Hi, Inbar, I'll pass the mic to you. Hello, uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, I believe you all can see it now. Oh my gosh, Justin, that org chart just like blew my mind. I'm like, where am I inside which square below that square? Um, yes, I am one of the um, people on this panel who uh, works for uh, New York City government. So I'm gonna be kind of talking about my perspective from inside the machine um, when it comes to um, the public realm. Um, so let's start here. Um, does anyone know what this is? Um, because this is a uh, webinar and I can't see you, I'm just gonna venture to guess what you think it might be. Um, no, it's not an iPhone. Um, it's actually the Amazon Fire Phone. And uh, you might be unfamiliar with this. What's the Amazon Fire Phone, um, you ask? Well, it's a product that was uh, discontinued after one year of production. It just didn't quite make it. But why? This guy. Wait, who's that? Yes, that's right. That's the big guy, Jeff Bezos. Um, so, ooh, I went ahead, sorry. Um, that's Jeff Bezos holding up his beautiful Amazon Fire Phone. And the thing is he created this product without taking feedback from actual users. He micromanaged it and he nitpicked all of these details um, that were intended to dazzle the user. Like for example, the phone was supposed to be 3D. Um, I don't really understand how that works. He built it in a bubble and he didn't really let people in. So ultimately the phone didn't work. The UX was awful and people hated it. So it failed and quite expensively. So our lesson from that is if you don't listen, your project fails. So um, what does that mean for designers of the public realm? Well, we are trained to think of ourselves as geniuses, right? As folks who solve big problems. But um, at this, in this industry, um, that means we design uh, based on our own biases, preferences, and lived experience. So um, in a profession dominated by white folks, that can be quite a problem. 
So this was the defining feature of the public realm in this past year. People are asking and demanding that we pay attention. Um, and while most of the conversation was focused on policing, there are additional messages that we need to hear loud and clear. Public space is only safe for certain people. Um, so whether you're jogging like Ahmaud Arbery or birding like Christian Cooper, the places we design have not guaranteed safety of Black, Indigenous, people of color, which is why we as practitioners of the built environment need to center voices of uh, people who are traditionally underrepresented um, in the planning and design and decision making of these spaces. If this industry rests on traditional assumptions, um, if we design in a bubble like Jeff Bezos did, we're at risk of designing a space that may be beautiful to some, but actively hostile to black and brown folks. Um, so simply put, we have been creating products that do not serve the needs of the people we intend to serve because we don't ask what they need. And if they tell us, we don't necessarily listen. So while we can laugh when a smartphone design in a bubble fails, public realm design in a bubble can actually have deadly consequences. So let's talk about where we fail. Um, I'm a transportation planner, so I'm gonna kind of walk through how we do it. Um, in transportation planning, this is how the process kind of goes. Um, ooh, you've got an idea. You collect your data, lots and lots of data, and you make your plan with um, not very much engagement. You go and propose your plan to the community. And um, when uh, they see you, they're baffled. They're like, who are you? Um, they've never seen you before and they have no idea what you're talking about. And they've actually been having a completely different conversation and have been asking for something else for years. So it's like you walk up to a stranger and you say, oh, hi, um, I love you. I have two years of data to prove that we are gonna have beautiful children. Will you marry me? They'd be like, no, no, get away from me. Um, you're freaking me out. Um, that's not a really good process for engagement. So how can we be more equitable about the way we engage? Um, instead, you can wonder about the community, make um, like wonder what makes them tick. Oh, so then you go on dates, um, you go uh, meet their grandparents, you go to Thanksgiving, you really get to know each other. Um, and then when you finally propose, they know who you are. They can make an informed choice um, and you've been having a conversation this whole time instead of some freakish um, out of nowhere proposal. So how did I apply this? Um, how's this applied at, uh, within government? What can you do? So in 2015 at DOT, we started the Street Ambassador Program. And this is a team of 10 um, who serve as an outreach arm that directly communicates with the public um, for a lot of what we call our street improvement projects, which is anything from bus lanes to bike lanes to sidewalk extensions to plazas, um, a lot of the difference, like the changes that you've been seeing um, on our city streets. Um, so this uh, program is very intentionally designed. It's designed to be equitable. Um, we're very intentional about hearing from everyone and, uh, and where we go and who we reach out to. Um, the team is multilingual, and so um, we'll often flip-flop in languages depending on um, who we are talking to. Um, and if we don't have the language in-house on our team, we always bring interpreters um, uh, with us so that we can easily have conversations. Um, the team is flexible. Um, we work on weekends, uh, morning rush hour, evening events. Um, we're not holding a, a set meeting that you have to come to. We are just going to where you are living your lives and just um, popping in and, and making it easy to participate. Um, we're also respectful. So we honor the time that busy New Yorkers are able to give. We can do all of this um, in 10 minutes or less. Um, and we entice people to participate by offering useful giveaways like reusable tote bags or super chic sunglasses. So that's a bit of a thank you for um, sharing your personal experience with us. Um, I like to call this model the bookmobile of civic engagement. Um, so we're dating the community, right? Where are we going? Bustling streets, movie theaters, parks, um, you know, date spots like libraries and rec centers, uh, bike lanes, senior centers. Okay, these are clearly no longer date spots, but these are just places that you go in your regular life. Um, and our model is pretty simple. Um, street ambassador plus phone equals instant data. We have our conversations and we log everything in SurveyMonkey or in like a variety of um, tools. Um, and so we can take all these conversations and make them into data that our planners can use. This is what it looks like out in the field. Um, so when it, you see pictures of street ambassadors, they're not texting, they're actually just logging information. Um, so here's just an example of what this looks like when we go out and about. Uh, problem alert, okay, this is Soundview Avenue. Um, as, a, as an agency, it was identified as a corridor that needed improvements. Um, 
from our perspective, we can see a lot of issues. There's irregular intersections, missing crosswalks, um, an incomplete pedestrian network. People were crossing all over the place. Um, but we don't know what it's like to live and cross that street. Um, so when we send the street ambassadors out there, we want to share what we know and why we are going out there to talk to people in the first place. So we always bring boards with us, or we often bring boards with us. Um, so in this case, we had a what we know board and then a tell us your concerns board. So our what we know board was like, what's the stats? What's the safety? Um, what are the safety concerns? Um, how does this street fit into the broader network of bus service, bike lanes, things like that? And then our tell us your concerns uh, board is basically a map where people could choose from like a menu of four options of like what are the top issues they wanted to report. Um, here's what it looks like out um, in the world. This is uh, the Soundview Library. Um, and as you can see, we've got people engaging um, in what effectively is like a public meeting, but just happening where they were already going. Um, we took that data and we crunched it. Um, and we went back out and shared, here's what your neighbors told us. Are we on track? Um, is this, in fact, the problems that, um, that you are also experiencing? So you'll see on the left, we've got um, kind of summary of what we heard when we were out um, the first time, and then a second opportunity to um, tell us more about your experiences. Um, I just want to point out, if you haven't noticed, that the boards are also translated into Spanish, and it's very important for us to have everything be on the same board. Um, it's um, basically an invitation for people to come up and talk to us. So here's what it looked like out in the field. Um, you'll see a lot of conversations happening. Um, so all of this um, got taken, turned into data, and then turned into very real projects. Um, this is a slip lane that was closed and is now um, kind of a plaza area with um, art on the street, kind of similar to what Justin was showing earlier. Um, these are two um, intersections that were redesigned in um, response to what we heard um, and also like additional data, like can we narrow this? Uh, is there available space? Um, so big picture, um, you know, the question was kind of, what do I want our next mayor to do in regards to the public realm? I think um, in this case, it's pretty simple. Um, just get out there and listen. Um, it's not actually that hard to do if you just go to where people are. So thank you, that's my piece right now. Thanks so much, Himbar. Really exciting to see all the kind of incredible work that your little big team has kind of done in these past couple of years. I'd love to invite um, all of our panelists to join us on screen so we can jump into the conversation. I also welcome all our attendees to feel free to start plugging in questions either on our Q&A box or in the chat. I'll try to weave them in or try to uh, kind of find a, a time uh, to kind of bring you on um, and unmute you. There's a possibility we can uh, almost radio style kind of join you on screen. Um, terrific. So I want to first kind of pose the first question to Seb and Inbar, also open it up to the rest of you because it's kind of gone full circle in terms of presentations around kind of design process. So within our own community at the forum, we're seeing how uh, the design profession is really kind of pushing to shift away from the very typical kind of top-down approach to a more participatory design process. I think especially in light of the past year, um, how can we steer um, or help steer the design profession to guide more community-led co-design and inclusive approaches and processes that are not necessarily typically taught to young planners and designers? And uh, maybe first to Seven and Bar, but I'll definitely open it up to everyone else. Uh, sure, I can go first. Thanks for the question, Guillermo and, and Bar. Really loved seeing your presentation. I think it's very similar. It's, I feel like my answer would draw from my presentation and also in bars in terms of creating infrastructures that allow meaningful engagement with folks whose lived experience is directly informing um, the challenges of the built environment uh, to have a voice at the table. And for our project with Queens Museum, it's possible because of this federal grant where we can you know, pay people a stipend to spend time critiquing a building and coming up with design solutions together. You know, for Inbar's uh, street ambassadors team, you know, these are generous residents that are willing to um, stop and give 10 minutes of their time and get a swag bag in return. But I think engagement, what's not talked about enough is the kind of trade or kind of compensation or making it a meaningful exchange for people to give their time. And I feel like sometimes if you don't explicitly offer something in return, it becomes exploitative. And you see, I feel like lots of issues with participation washing. If you look at like the sidewalk labs project in Toronto, you see, you know, there were like lots of nice 
like high definition photographs of focus groups, but it ended up not really being a listening process. So I feel like in order to really like kind of sustain engagement, you want to build up uh, resident leaders and create that infrastructure. So maybe it's not just a one-time survey, but maybe there's this cohort of people that are really invested in this and also getting paid to share their expertise. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And also, I think it's very important, like, I think people are getting really excited about engagement right now, and that's very good. But um, but you have to be careful about, like, over-asking and kind of, like, over-engaging and under-delivering. So, um, like, if we have, like, a group, okay, there's, like, 90 um, people, and uh, I can see in this webinar right now, and then, like, 90 people each want to go to the same neighborhood and engage deeply um, with the community on whatever their one project is, that's exhausting to the people who are there who are like, oh, you're asking me again? I just talked to this person. What happened to what I told them? So it's like very important to um, either keep your scope with what it, with like whatever you actually control um, and be very honest and straightforward about like where is this information going and I think um, sharing back is really important. And that's something that we haven't really been able to do with the street ambassadors yet is like a lot of the sharing back because the time scale is so fast, but that's definitely something that would be very important for us to continue doing. Uh, I, I would just add that um, one on kind of the bureaucratic side, right? There has to be built into the scopes of work and RFPs and all those different things that there's uh, actually money and resources and time allocated to that process. So that's something that really needs to uh, change. I would argue that the entire process is sort of messed up. It sort of values like creation work, but not uh, sort of understanding work and definitely not maintaining work after the fact, like did what we designed and, and built and cut the ribbon on actually do <laughs> Uh, what we thought. So, you know, all of those processes need to sort of broaden out and include that so that we can build a pattern of actually understanding this stuff better. Um, because that's, that's not how any of the, the structures and systems and processes are designed to date, both from the private sector side and, and uh, within government, which frankly is responding to, to private sector. The other piece I would add is that uh, the large majority of people doing this work have a lot of unlearning to do and are, for the most part, miseducated. Um, and so we can say like, hey, new mayor, new agency, let's put something in place and we're going to do things this way. But that doesn't mean that people are capable of doing it at scale um, and, and with the sort of the depth of understanding that's really needed. So there's a, a bigger project around kind of training uh, unlearning all sorts of different things that need to happen, not just, oh, it's the city or city agency's fault, it's our entire field and profession's fault and everything connected to that from our associations to the schools, uh, that there is a ton of work uh, that, that needs to happen uh, so that you're, you're not putting things that sound nice, right? Oh, we're gonna do this plan, here's our PowerPoint, here's our shiny brochure. Uh, nobody knows how to actually do it, right? So that, that's something that we have to kind of take responsibility for and not only point to things like leadership and government in terms of where the responsibility lies. I had a, another thing too, if I could add that what we found was it was important, not only in this project, but even in other ones to connect with existing groups who are already working in communities and whose work will span whatever project we create and develop and, and um, engage their expertise and knowledge in the process as a compensated, like acknowledger of expertise. And we worked with, I mentioned Picture the Homeless to develop um, ethical research model for how to engage with people who had been homeless in the public realm. Um, and that kind of approach to seeking engagement, I think, to, to acknowledge that as designers, we often are not the experts in whatever community we're working in. And there are almost always people who have built trust relationships and can um, they that need to be involved in the process as well. And 
I think one last thing to add is the importance of um, allowing engagement to be a kind of continued and ongoing conversation. Uh, so often design projects um, may seek engagement at the beginning or, you know, sort of uh, implement uh, different ways of connecting that um, ultimately a final product is produced and then that's sort of the end of the discourse, right? And um, I think a number of times uh, already in this discussion, you know, the, the kind of importance of rethinking design standards or codes or, um, you know, some of the, the specific um, requirements that, that very much control the way public space looks. Uh, if those could be more of a kind of discussion, right, and, and sort of an ongoing, evolving um, way of, of, you know, implementing um, inclusive strategies that, that is, you know, truly, um, you know, sort of circular in implementation and response. I want to, I want to tap into a specific um, kind of thread each of you, or at least some of you were kind of acknowledging is around the kind of valuing community expertise. In our conversations in the past year, as we developed our 21 Visions platform, we discussed a lot on how labor and time can be really taxing on residents, especially during the community engagement process. Um, I'm wondering what are some, some ways the next administration can really value that community expertise and voice? Um, both has like as a almost counter exploitative goal. Um, I think also a way to build trust, but also kind of a, uh, what are some carrots in order to bring more voices into the planning process because not everyone is necessarily, or there are specific communities that are underrepresented or not at the table. So I'm wondering if there are any sp interesting ideas or, or kind of goals you'd like to kind of point out for the next mayor. I mean, I think you know what I'm gonna say because <laughs> uh, that was my whole thing. But I think it's it's very easy to make it to, I think like the time thing, the, going somewhere and you taking time to participate is very, very hard. So my big push is like, make it as easy as possible and just go where people are. Um, I will say that uh, procurement of, um, of like of giving things away, it's like very hard to uh, in the city to actually give things away and purchase things. So that's part of why our giveaways are um, just like tote bags and sunglasses and stuff. Um, we aren't able to really give away money, unfortunately, um, in the process that we do. But as far as people's time is concerned, I think it's very easy to just show up where they are. Um, but also always make sure that you're invited. I just want to point that out too. That like in working with partners, you um, you ask them to set you up for the conversation. One thing that immediately comes to mind, like following in Bar's comment is like, in terms of incentivization, like, yeah, whether it's swag bags or like a Metro card or something, I think that helps for kind of real time interactions. But also if there was an opportunity to create kind of like a more permanent or semi permanent site in a community that's like, maybe just a nicer version of like we see so many, you know, restaurants propping up and taking up a lot of sidewalk or parking space if there was something like that that was kind of a hub where people knew they could always go to to talk to someone about something or drop in feedback that was kind of planted in a community. I think that would help too to kind of, uh, yeah, take away the impermanence of you know those one time survey opportunities that then is lost if you weren't there at the right time. And some, something I would kind of add to the conversation, I agree with sort of all of these points and, and kind of with the initial framing of the question, there's this sort of power landscape that, that we have to understand is, is an assumption, right, about kind of where we're going to and you know, underserved or predominantly black or brown or low income community, et cetera, and like figuring out what are the dynamics to make that interaction happen, but I would argue that I would hope that leadership in the next administration understands that a lot more work and energy actually needs to go to other power landscapes and to demand and require more of those, right? So it's not about going to people that are already overburdened and under stress to do more and, add, and ask and engage. It's to people that have enjoyed benefits and power and control and agency for a long time to ask that they do more to change, right? 
where, 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 you know, where are you going to go to the predominantly white or predominantly upper income community and ask them to do to change and to do differently and put a lot of energy and pressure and tools and tricks and everything to do that work? Because that's the imbalance that we keep seeing over and over and over in, in, in this city and frankly, uh, uh, generally. And so while all this work is legitimately needed to kind of help address longstanding issues, kind of learn, learn what people need. There, there's other types of work needed in this city. The, the Soho rezoning is a great example. Uh, you know, the, the current administration, there is an, an idea to go to multiple communities and, and to ask for multiple communities to change and provide things like more housing opportunities and affordability opportunities. And many of those things died and we all know why they died. Yet the, the black and brown and lower income communities are constantly asked to do more. So that whole conversation, like no one's gonna talk about it in a, in a sustained way, it will all be about how do we make the little bit better. And I think there needs to be more focus on a much bigger conversation. Thanks for that, Justin. I, I want to pose a question to Margaret, but I think there's there's some uh, a connecting thread, as, especially to your presentation, Seb, as well. Um, especially kind of a the on uh, maybe it's a question on kind of a, a user end or end user, excuse me. Um, well, Margaret, you and your collaborators at uh, during our forefront fellowship um, were focusing on how to create kind of a dignified public spaces. I think with the goal specifically for those experiencing homelessness in the public realm, but I think. Um, kind of through that proposal, you end up creating kind of a dignified public space for everyone in that process. I I'm wondering what are other ways the city kind of can ensure that every resident really feels a, a sense of belonging um, in public space or public buildings. And maybe we can kind of walk through a little bit about that process of kind of, because um, I think Seb as well pointed that out, um, the way we intend or create and design specific bathrooms can both help um, and support people with disabilities, but also those who kind of need private spaces in order to uh, as spaces for prayer, et cetera. Yeah, that's um, something that came up quite a bit when in our research and in our um, work with Picture of the Homeless was that um, what happens in the public space has a really big impact on how people feel in that space and if they feel welcome or not. So um, something that was forefront on people's minds was the new increase and, and focus on programming in the public realm. And this is something that business improvement districts um, really have, it's one of their primary tools um, in the last couple of years, ranging from like programming the space for yoga or um, pop-up cafes or other things like that as a way to activate the space. But that had often the kind of converse effect of making it feel very unwelcome and it was seen as a clear signal to those who were either, um, you know, longtime users of that space for whatever reason or not viewed as the target audience that they were no longer welcome and this is not a space for you. Um, and so I think, you know, this kind of goes back to the whole ecosystem of who is managing the public realm and um, who's, who, bids have a lot to, to figure out and they can't do it all by themselves. Um, so many of them uh, are working with community organizations. Those who aren't can do that. And I would think that the more pressure there is um, about how, how the space is managed, um, either from, from the city or from the public or from whatever avenue, I think the more people will begin to understand um, the dynamics that are at play and how our public space is programmed. Yeah, that's what I thought was really powerful about Margaret's presentation about like asking us to look a level up in terms of the management or policing of the space because you can design a pocket park that you know has really great textured um, paving for people that are blind using um, you know a walking a walking cane um, and then it has a beautiful cutout that moves into smooth kind of like a, a graded ramp for wheelchair users and allows those to coexist and you have the most comfortable benches in the world for um, you know people that are seniors that need you know armrests to transfer from uh, a walker to a seating but if that space is 
policed in a way that makes it feel unwelcoming in terms of a history of that space or just knowing that you're not welcome there because you have people in your family that have had like uncomfortable experiences or encounters with the police there. All those design things at the scale of the body won't matter at all. So those two things have to happen in constant conversation. I'd love to kind of pull in Lindsay as well, because I think restorative ground, the work that you're developing in collaboration with WIP is, it was, I think, specifically looking at how can we draw in um, multiple communities uh, in order to activate and program the space. But I think it maybe it was led specifically through um, your research on neurodiversity. Yeah, I think this point has already been said, but it's worth always considering how much designing for particular, you know, um, underserved communities is beneficial to all, right? And so what we found is that strategies um, for better spaces for people with intellectual and, and developmental disabilities are also more supportive and enjoyable spaces for everyone. So this idea that specificity, diversity, um, you know, thinking of these as, uh, thinking of kind of engagement of different populations as ways to actually improve the public realm for everyone is important um, and specifically with restorative ground cited where it is in in Hudson Square which is a, a little bit of a kind of ambiguous or, or um, you know um, kind of transient uh, population in terms of the specific neighborhood uh, a lot of office buildings and, and sort of um, you know transient populations um, it, that, that sort of move through that space. So our idea, idea was, um, you know, on the one hand informed by this research about neurodiversity um, or design for neurodiversity, um, but also informed by looking at the local organizations that, that might be involved, that might be able to uh, use this space, um, organizations like the Children's Museum that's very close by or um, organizations that work with um, youth populations and just thinking about um, how this, uh, you know, small streetscape installation could be a platform to enable them to have, you know, a safe outdoor space, um, you know, during the pandemic to, to use for some of their programming. Um, certainly thinking about how it could encourage um, you know different kinds of informal and formal um, programmed and sort of spontaneous uh, things to happen um, but you know understanding the limitations of uh, this particular site in this particular context and and um, uh, thinking through you know strategies to um, to kind of bring as many kind of different groups to the table in order to think about how we could use um, this small piece of the built environment. That's it. I like how you're talking about that, Lindsay. And, and I know this has also been said by Cho, said, but um, uh, your, Seb, your points about um, designing for all the proposals that you made in the restroom project would help trans people but they help everybody else too. It makes it so much better and that really broadens the idea of who is the public, right? And we just need to keep reinforcing that and hammering that as designers. That's a role that we can play is broadening the definition of who is the public, um, that the public is the user group here. Um, and, and remembering like people have many, many different drivers in the way they use public space, whether they're parents with children, whether they're caregivers of someone with disabilities, whether they're elderly, um, or whether they have religious requirements, you know, there's so, there's so much diversity in it. And when that is worked into the public realm and allows people to sit on the side and watch what's going on or be an active part of everything or um, just kind of relax like all these things that Lindsay you were building into the play spaces it becomes like an incredibly vibrant and rich space that is you know what I think is so beautiful about successful public spaces and about being in a city um, so if we can make it happen it's just really incredible and and there are some really good examples of how people have done that, that we've gone through today and, and that exists throughout the city. I'd love to throw a kind of a bit of a wrench in that in this conversation because 
it's something that I've been actively thinking about and I'm wondering how the next administration will kind of approach this. And it's really kind of around the kind of the politics of public space and potentially competing stakeholders and hierarchies. Um, and, and maybe this is more specifically, and we're seeing a little bit more with um, the activation of the open restaurants program, but I'm wondering what are what is some good advice for the next administration when, when kind of nav navigating around um, challenges around street vendors in public space and, and a lot of the tension that we're noticing um, with um, commercial property owners, et cetera, it's, it's not just necessarily activating public space, but also there is a livelihood that's created through public space. Guillermo, do you mean like the policing of informal economies in terms of people that might be a street vendor without a license? Yeah, I, it's kind of uh, around, yes. Well, I have a not policing, but internal conflict response, I think. Um, well, first off, you know, in working with communities, you always have to recognize that you're entering a conversation that's already happening. Um, and some things that are community driven, like for example, um, open streets is like community requested, but you have to be aware of like who from the community requested it and then where are they like, where are you in the context of that community conversation? So not every open street is welcomed by every community that they pop into and vice versa. Um, and so at some point, you, you know, you have to move forward and decide what you're going to do, but I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and then I think even like um, you brought up the like open restaurants and the idea of the curb. And I think that the, the curb is one of the most contested spaces in New York City. Um, and it is the, the point of most contradiction for even like one user of it. Um, so, um, so if you ask people what they want, they will tell you one piece of their experience, but um, just like as an example of how people use the curb, because um, if there are non-New Yorkers um, in this, you know, watching, we don't have alleys. So everything happens on the curb in front of the buildings. Um, so let's say we're talking about one restaurant. Um, they, they may be asking for parking um, for their customers, but they receive deliveries by truck that has to load at the curb and has access at the curb. Um, their customers may be dining in an open restaurant at the curb. Um, their customers might also arrive by bus or by bike, and they may be making deliveries by bike or car. Um, so within that whole, within just one storefront, you've already had like, like a hundred competing uses of and the, the curb. Um, and so, and the trash, oh my gosh, and the trash, thank you. Um, so just thinking about like, how do you allocate this like precious space? I think it's just, um, it is all in conflict with each other and it is very hard to figure out what, what to do and how to move forward. Yeah, we, to, to that point, when, when I was at PDC, we had a lot of conversations about stuff on the street. Uh, and, and it's sort of a, a, an evolving landscape. There's the, the newsstands and the trash cans and the utility poles and now maybe vehicle charging and 5G and links and, and all, of, all of these sort of things competing for the space. And I think the, uh, you know, for DOT is sort of having to, to kind of navigate so many different things, but along with all the different agencies, fire department thinking about safety, uh, uh, all the kind of other infrastructure that that's below the sidewalks. There's so many different considerations, um, and, and including things like safety and security, right? That that have uh, become a concern. You know, the uh, car going a little too fast could, could become a problem. So I, I think there has to be a, sort of an acknowledgement of the full ecosystem, for for lack of a better term, and to think about what the, the power dynamics are in, in who is sort of able to s sort of have their, their, their space in as uh, the city is sort of changing. And I, I think the, uh, the, the vendor, the street vendor, um, you know, out, out in LA, right, there, there were kind of legal things connected to ICE and all sorts of craziness uh, uh, that were connected to this idea of how we police 
um, uh, our, our public activities that, that need to actually be happening in a, in a sort of a holistic conversation. And so, I, you know, I, I, I do think the city is in a position because so much is changing to at this moment, bring in as many different stakeholders as, as possible and, and look at the whole landscape. Uh, and I, I would argue that what's happened to date is great. Uh, it's, it's transformative, but everybody that's seen what's going on knows that people with more money and power are winning, right? The, the argument is that, oh, we're all winning, it's more active, but no, people that you know could afford to have been able to take over public space is what's actually happening, <laughs> right? Like, let, and we have to name that that is what's happening. And a lot of designers and people are getting really excited, oh, the, the possibilities, that's great, but you have to understand what the actual change of landscape is, is doing, which is a, a degree of privatization of, of public space without a whole lot of conversation about, a, a holistic conversation about public benefit other than activities good for the city, right? And so, you know, what were, there are lots of things the city needs that as this public space is changing, aren't able to kind of gain traction because we're only focused on what does it take to save our restaurants? Not say our restaurants shouldn't be saved, but there are other things that, that the city needs that are missing from, from that conversation about how our public space is being used. Yeah, thank you, Justin. And I think like looking at those conflicts in a very transparent way and tensions is so important. For example, Mix Design was working on a project with DOT a few years ago, thinking about you know public restrooms in New York, which are you know the kind of like the plague of the city in terms of people just needing to take care of their bodies. And I love how all these conflicts and tensions really crystallized when you're actually designing something where you want to have something full privacy, um, so people can you know take care of their bodies in peace. But you also need to have openings to police in case something happens in there. Are you really worried about someone having a medical emergency and you need to be able to open the door? Or are you worried that someone's gonna complain that someone living on the street is now like, you know, living in the, the public toilet? Um, I feel like these things like kind of always crystallize and it comes down to the priority of, you know, who's complaining um, and then who's left to kind of manage the use of a public restroom. You know, you see uh, kind of like, um, benevolent design features like, oh, like after you leave the restroom, you know, there's a, a big soap spray that's a self-cleaning thing or a timed door that will open after a certain number of minutes so you don't stay in there too long. Like, is it really about the cleaning and like the, the use of the door or is it to make sure no one loiters in there too long? So I think like when you think about that moment where the restaurant owner complains about someone sleeping in the public toilet outside of their restaurant, it's like that's that moment of tension where it's like, okay, whose needs are going to be prioritized here? What can be done in the short term versus what is something that designers are not equipped to handle, which is honestly, in my opinion, like at that point, designers have done what we can and it's not our job. I don't know. Thanks for that. I want to last, ask one last question, and it's kind of one on maintenance and care, since we, we love talking about maintenance at the forum. Um, and this kind of ties a little bit to one of the questions in our Q&A box by, by Emmy Stiegler on um, investments and improvements in neighborhoods, especially in the outer boroughs. Um, oftentimes, we see long-term costs or contingencies not necessarily properly addressed up front. Um, as we've seen specifically with the maintenance of the public realm and public buildings, so many of our MTA elevators, escalators, bathrooms are out of service all throughout the city. Um, the current administration is, is starting to look at um, opportunities to kind of leverage the pr private development to build or fund better, better transit for accessibility and station improvements. I'm wondering, is there an opportunity for the next mayor to kind of better leverage the private sector in order to, to, um, to deliver greater public realm improvements, uh, such as, as, the, as um, zoning for accessibility, which is currently now in the, in the works. Um, something that I thought about during this conversation is the importance of sort of just testing ideas. Um, in a city like New York, um, you know, with such a challenging scale, um, there's, there is so much of a need to, to you know, mandate ways of, of sort of addressing issues across the entire city. Um, but I think what, you know, especially designers are, are sort of interested in and in, in kind of rethinking um, the public, the design of the public realm 
is, you know, sort of prototyping ideas, right? Um, that's a little bit how we thought about this, uh, the restorative ground project, right? This is not something that should be implemented everywhere and will solve all the problems, but introduces a new way of thinking about this particular space in this context and for these people. And um, that was enabled by a private partnership. And uh, in a way, I see that as a great opportunity for for the private sector to to fund some of the experimentation that's necessary to you know test and and address issues and and fail and you know get feedback and and better understand i think the, the only way i see kind of how the private sector can be very supportive is like like right now for example like everybody is responsible for the sidewalk in front of their space right and so again like if we kind of like what justin was saying earlier like people with money and power will maintain their space very nice and so i think the only way you can really get at the whole city is if there's some kind of like pro not profit sharing but like a pool of money that like all the fancy neighborhoods and all of the friends of and conservancies and everything like put into a pot that isn't just for their area and is um distributed equitably, because they'll always be able to maintain the public space in front of their building. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I've, I think I finished. I'm just rambling now, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I think part of um, asking private organizations to fund and develop public space it, that is a part of the kind of management ecosystem that we were looking at in our work. And, um, you know, on the one hand, we can ask to disrupt that and to, you know, shift funding away from areas that we think are not necessary as a public and into other areas that we do want. Um, that is a lot of the conversation that's going on right now with how the city allocates funding within different agencies and departments, especially in regard to public safety and, and the police. Um, but I think kind of to Justin's earlier point about the city org chart, we need to also think about, you know, okay, we have this public private partnership ecosystem now, what can we do in order to improve that and ensure that private investments in the public realm are truly for the public good and can be um, maintained that way, um, whether that's through existing community partnerships, not just with private organizations that are like developers that are building, but with also community focused groups that have a, a hand in it and a role in it, um, or whether that's through some other kind of um, ongoing process, I'm not sure, but um, I think that has we kind of have to approach it in, in two ways, I guess, the, the big picture and then how to work with what we've got right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, um, you know, I, I also agree with the point that kind of private sector and I would connect to private sector like the, you know, nonprofit and philanthropy, right, can can test and, and have some of the, the sort of experiments and failures in government just isn't set up to, to necessarily do. So I, I think that's valid in an ongoing way, right? Kind of way back, right? The, the Georgist type, you know, land value capture and like there are other mechanisms and things that, that could be explored to, to look at how do you actually balance kind of benefit and, and resource more equitably uh, uh, for the city. But something I, I would add and, and kind of background for that, that slide, I put the work chart that put the Department of Care when I made that slide, it was during the conversations about um, NYPD budget during the protests. And there was sort of the politicians said, we're going to take a billion dollars from the NYPD and do other things with it. And so that purple box with the, the tentacles into different agencies was what would happen if a billion dollars out of the city's budget, uh, we're probably close, you know, 900, or sorry, 90 something billion, probably close to 100, right? One, what would it what would it look like? And it's it's not necessarily a conversation about only what the private <laughs> sector uh, can do. It's like we have a mechanism; people pay taxes, and you know <laughs> that. And there, I, I think there is an opportunity to to ask what what the public sector can do, and to look 
at all the different things it's doing, how it's doing, where it's it's doing them, and to say it's, uh, you know, maybe if you're not spending a certain amount of money doing certain things in these black and brown communities, like money is being spent in black and brown communities, but what is it being spent on? And you have to have that conversation too. I mean, people have overlaid the maps of where, where, which areas are highly policed and which areas are not receiving investment in their public realm. And many times they overlap. And this is something that we can change. Terrific. Any, any last points? I saw someone muted, but um, before we wrap up, I know oh, I was we're just almost gonna, out of time. I was just connecting it to the person uh, in the Q and A. Um, Amy Stiegler, who was kind of talking about how to um, get outer borough neighborhoods attention as well, and that they only seem to gain attention after processes of gentrification. So I was just going to throw into the roulette that, you know, the, what is the incentive for the private sector to, you know, assist in a, in a less resource neighborhood and just being mindful of what exchanges are happening and making sure that, I don't know, there's some processes of participatory budgeting or oversight or accountability to make sure that, you know, what might seem like a benevolent donation or funding uh, is actually so. Absolutely. So we're out of time today. I'd like to give a huge thank you to all our speakers who joined us today. Seb, Lindsay, Justin, Margaret, and Amar. Truly inspiring work you're all leading. Um, I want to thank everyone else um, who's listening in and tuned in, everyone on our team who helped organize today's event, uh, as well as our, our fellows, Director Circle and City Community Development for your support with our Shapeshift series. Uh, we call on all, all of you who, uh, who are watching today to help get the word out, circulate our 21 visions for 2021, um, and really push uh, the candidates across city council, uh, borough presidents, comptroller, and the mayor to center equity uh, in the design and development process. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, keep in touch um, and have a great rest of the day.